Welcome to the Fresh RN Podcast. The information contained in this podcast is meant to supplement your existing knowledge and not replace it. Always refer to your state board of nursing, standards of care, and respective institutions' policies to guide your practice. All identifying patient details have been changed to protect their privacy and remain compliant with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Thanks, nurses. Stay fresh. What's up, guys, and welcome to the Fresh RN Podcast. I am Katie Kleber. And I am Alyssa Stafford. And we are elated today to have a wonderful guest. We are actually recording from Houston at the, Nas or the National Teaching Institute, or NTI, conference that is held by the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. Uh, me and Melissa are veterans of this conference, I think. <laughs> well, maybe. Ish. We've, ish. We've been to three of them in our careers, and, and we love this conference. And we have the honor of having Kathleen Pantillo here today, and she is the winner of the 2017 AACN Pioneering Spirit Award. And I just want you guys to understand, me and Melissa went to the super session and that 6,000 nurses in one room, and Kathleen got an award in front of everyone and a standing ovation. That's so right. I just want you to <laughs> understand the presence we're in right now. And we are sitting in that room going, yeah, yeah. Like and I, I may have taken a picture of you <laughs> <laughs> up on stage, like, we're going to be a year. Um, so she is a professor and research scientist in the School of Nursing at University of California, San Francisco. And since 1999, she's been involved in research related to the integration of palliative care with critical care. And I'm just elated to interview her and talk about palliative care, because that's something Melissa and I, and actually Elizabeth, who's not here, are very passionate about. And one thing as a new nurse that I didn't know, I didn't know, was really the difference between the palliative care and hospice and really understanding how we can leverage palliative care to provide the best care to our patients as possible. So thank you for being here. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Yay. This so is terrific. Our, one of the, the first thing I want to ask you is to define the difference between hospice and palliative care and maybe give us an example or two of a patient that would qualify or palliative care would be great for them, but they don't qualify for hospice. Very good. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question to start with because um, there is this lack of understanding of the concept of palliative care and where hospice is and if is, is hospice the only place where palliative care is provided? So let me, let me tell you, let's start with palliative care. Palliative care is a philosophy of providing care to pay people with serious illnesses and providing this care um, to their families as well. So it's about serious illness and there are three key domains of palliative care. And that is, the first is symptom management the second is communication and how we can have the best communication possible. And third is family engagement. So then with that philosophy, then we practice palliative care by looking at these domains and uh, introducing into our practice what the patient and his or her family need in the area of palliative care. So where does hospice fit in? Hospice is a structure. It's a structured approach to palliative care. It's like an institution. And so hospice patients always receive palliative care, yes. And most of the time, the hospice care is provided to the patient and the family in their homes. There are some hospice inpatient hospice settings, but it's, it's a in-home um, structure by which cali with which palliative care is provided. Hospice is not the only palliative care. So when we go back to the more global um, palliative care item or tag, palliative care can be provided wherever there are seriously ill patients uh, who have needs for symptom management and family might need communication and um, we need to bring the families in and support them as well. So, Perfect. Is that? Absolutely. Now, okay. what about, so any simple examples of a patient who palliative care is perfect for them, but they're not, hospice would not, would not be appropriate. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking someone with congestive heart failure. Yes. 
That's a great, that is a great, I was going to say uh, lung disease, you know, like mm. COPD, but, and congestive failure, yes. So they may be, they have a disease that is going to be constant over a period of time. Mm -hmm. They may certainly not be at the end of their lives. And their disease uh, acuity can ebb and flow mm, okay. over a period of time. So through the, if they, they have a serious illness, mm -hmm. it's not the illness that's going to kill them tomorrow, but they have needs. Mm -hmm. And they have needs, for example, for symptom management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the dyspnea, the thirst, the fatigue. Um, so they have, and I, I could go on, um, several symptoms that if they're managed well, that brings comfort to the patient you know, during this sometimes long stretch of living with this illness. Perfect examples of they're not necessarily ready for hospice, mm -hmm. but they have needs for palliative care. Mm -hmm. So hospice is provided is available for patients that have a, di a, di a prognosis of six months to live or less. Um, if a person is in hospice and they live longer than six months, they can be re-upped to, mm -hmm. to stay within hospice. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. So the, essentially, you don't have to be dying to get palliative care. This is, very, this is very clear, and this is, is another assumption that has come along with the rapid rise in palliative care in, yeah. in our country over, I would say, maybe the last 10 to 15 years. Yes, and oftentimes palliative care was referred to as end-of-life care. Well, that put the palliative care in a particular time in the person's life or dying process. No, it's not about end-of-life care. So if we talk about patients in the ICU, they may have a very short time until their demise. Mm -hmm. So maybe when they come in, they may be in the ICU for two or three days and they may be receiving end of life care quite quickly, mm -hmm. right? Or they may be in the ICU uh, for a longer period of time or come in with palliative care needs because of a chronic disease or something like that. So we, I like to say that every patient in the ICU needs palliative care. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you think about yeah. it, do they have symptoms? Yes, Absolutely. they have pain. Do they, you know, do they, are there, are there difficulties associated with communicating with their family? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So I think every, every person has yeah. symptoms palliative care needs. I do and I like that too because I work at a neuro ICU as Katie mm -hmm. did for a long time so I see patients that come in with strokes whether they be caused by an aneurysm or a, a blockage of a blood vessel doesn't really matter that's something they're going to be dealing with for a very long time mm -hmm. and whether they have speech difficulties swallowing difficulties pain um, altered sensorium I mean whatever the case may be these are these are symptoms that the patient has to deal with the family has to learn to cope with as well. Mm -hmm. So having that directive there, I think, is just a huge benefit for the patient and also for the family. Absolutely, for the family, yes, we do, we do include that. If we think of the word palliation, it means to relieve or to support. Hmm. So that's, you know, when you think that. about that, that palliative care is to relieve physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual mm -hmm. uh, issues with the patient. So. There's, um, let's see, I was just, I was going to say something else about the, the palliative care. Um, well, ask me another question. It probably will come <laughs> oh, yeah. to me. <laughs> well, so, because actually I really feel like, especially working in critical care, that I felt like the earlier palliative was brought on kind of the smoother things went because the, when patients are in the ICU, they're very complex. There's multiple physicians seeing them. And I really thought that palliative um, really helped put the pieces together for the family, mm -hmm. you know, because half the time, or not half the time, but it felt like a lot of the times the doctors would present kind of different pictures mm -hmm. and it really helped get sure. on the same page. Um, and I felt like the earlier we could do it, the better. But I didn't feel like physicians necessarily felt like that. Yeah. And I felt per the particular challenge dealing with surgeons. Mm -hmm. Like I remember one specific time, I had a patient that had a profound stroke, right? He was, um, th his best case scenario was um, pr total care, uh, knowing what's going on, but you know, no use of one side probably um, trach and peg for a while, but not necessarily permanent. So his life was going to be profoundly affected mm -hmm. by this 
this, um, and he already had some sort of disability at baseline, I couldn't remember. And I remember calling the surgeon and I was like, what do you think about getting palliative care? Mm -hmm. And he was very like, no, he's not dying. And I was like, well, I know, I, I remember, I don't know why I, I remember this verbatim. I was like, well, yeah, but his life is going to be, he's going to have profound disability even in the best case. You know, can we, can we bring them on to see how they can help kind of put the picture together and, and you know, symptom management and that kind of stuff. And he was like, yeah, sure, go ahead, click. <laughs> and, and I don't know if I really, I, I just, I felt like that was, that's one time I remember. But I know I've had that experience frequently, more so with surgeons. I don't know if that, and this is just my assumption, if it's like, a, okay, so that means giving up. Yes. So what kinds of... Yes. What's your experience with that, and what kind of tips for new nurses can you provide for maybe verbalizing or um, advocating in, a, in that way that's kind of like nudging, like, hey, this actually isn't giving up, and it's actually really needed, but how does a new nurse in their role of being kind of intimidated by doing that mm -hmm. do that, I guess? Well, that happens so much, of course, uh, and um, and I think um, talking about surgeons, they, they provide a good example of clinicians who want the best for their patient. Mm -hmm. They want them to survive. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And they may not have been as prepared into the what really is palliative care. So what I'd like to do is take a step back and talk about really two kinds of palliative care. And the first we can talk about is primary palliative care. And I'm not getting away from the surgeon question, but this, is, this may be helpful. Um, primary palliative care versus specialty or consultative palliative care. So primary palliative care is the type of care that can be provided to the patient's primary clinicians. So if you're in the ICU, the nurse taking care of the patient, the respiratory therapist, the clinical social worker, the ICU attending can provide palliative and do provide palliative care. It's how you look at palliative care. Can we um, can we address patient symptoms like you know pain and shortness of breath and all that? Yes, we can at the bedside because we do it. That's palliative care. Mm, that's interesting. Can we talk to the family mm -hmm. members and say, what are your concerns? And are you getting enough sleep? And you know, that's palliative care. Mm -hmm. When you're attending to these aspects or domains of palliative care. Now, when you say, um, can we call palliative? I think I know what you mean. And that is, can we bring in the palliative care service? Mm -hmm, exactly. That is specialty palliative care and consultative palliative care. So for a particular ICU patient, they might not need the palliative care service mm -hmm. if indeed their needs can be met by their own clinicians in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that means uh, um, extra preparation and education you know, kind of bumping up our knowledge about assessing, assessing symptoms and communication. And we run ICU nurse communication skills, skills workshops to promote them being empowered and mm. prepared to have these kinds of discussion. Yeah. When do you call in palliative care? Well, if the patient's situation is very complex, they're... Um, their symptoms aren't being, um, not that they're not being attempted to be managed, but they are, they have intractable pain, for example. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a family that is completely um, not handling the situation or, you know, very complicated family dynamics, well, it may be better to bring the specialists in to meet with the family and to have the discussions. So can you see that there there is a difference? So um, when you say call palliative, that might be calling your nurse colleague mm -hmm. next door who might have oh, better that makes sense. sense of how to manage this pain. Mm -hmm. When you say call palliative service, mm -hmm. that's secondary palliative care. Now, back to the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the definition was super important because I never really connected that I was actually providing palliative care. Me either. You are. I never you did. Are. You and are. And that's really kind of empowering to hear, mm -hmm. I think, and really cool because there are times when I would say, 
hey, I don't know how to manage this patient's pain. And I ask Melissa, and yes. I actually know I've done this before. <laughs> these meds aren't working. What do you think? I have these other ones ordered. And what do you think before I call the doctor? Or we have these protocols and, and you're really, or, or you know, I, or, or like, you know, you have you consult. the patient. You consult. consult each other yeah. and ask yeah. about how do I explain this to them yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I didn't, that's just really cool. So then it's like, I'm providing the, the direct, the primary palliative care. Yes. And then if we have a complex patient or irretractable pain or complex family dynamics, um, then it's like, okay, let's let's bring in the experts, the big guns yeah, here. The, the ones uh, who have particular expertise, yes. because that is their life and their world. That's yes. what they do all the time. I do want to make another um, point that I think it's very important for all of us to understand. Um, you know, so we work in ICUs and we say we're going to provide palliative care. Please don't think that you're stopping curative care. Mm -hmm. Palliative care and curative care can be addressed side by side. Um, so, you know, the, the, the patients with these big, huge surgeries that are meant to um, meant to cure them, or if you will, or, you know. Um, improve quality of life. For qual improve their quality of life. They're going to be discharged and they're going to go home. So they're getting curative care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where in their ICU for. That's where most patients are in the ICU for, yeah. rather than on a palliative care floor mm -hmm. or something like that. So don't think you have to make a choice. Yeah. Now, sometimes, according to how the patient goes, the curative care is not going to be enough for the patient, mm -hmm. and they really are approaching the end of their life. So you, at that point in time, the balance of care changes mm -hmm. from more curative than palliative to just the opposite. Now we're seeing this balance going more to palliative care, to prepare, um, to prepare the patient and the family to promote the best dying, dying with dignity, and mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. so forth. So we, we can see both in the ICU. Sometimes the balance of the two differs according to the patient's situation. I think that's important to hear the balance, and it's not all or nothing. It's not all or nothing. Because I think a lot of, and I think that's kind of a human way to think of things, mm -hmm. and not to, the default is it's either this or this, yeah. versus wait a minute, there's actually a balance here, and, and we need to consider that. So mm -hmm. that's, I think that's a really important concept to drive home, is, is the balance of the curative and the palliative, and knowing when things are shifting. Yes. And so that's, I really, I really like that. Do we want to go back to the surgeon? Let's go back okay. to the surgeon. <laughs> he's been waiting because, there. Yeah, yeah, he's been waiting, hanging on the phone, <laughs> just waiting. And um, all right, so this is where a nurse can do some really good education and use good communication. Um, if it now, it depends on what the nurse means by can we call palliative? Okay? That's good. So we are. Yes. Let's, let's so, yeah. pretend the nurse knows the difference between yes. the primary and the consult yeah. consulting. So and um, let's say, for example, this nurse's patient is really having trouble with symptoms. Okay. So the nurse could say to the surgeon, um, um, I'm thinking that maybe this is a patient that's good for palliative care um, to bring the palliative care team in. And then the surgeon says, my patient isn't dying. And oh, I've heard that many times. Oh, yeah. you know, my patients don't die. I've heard that too. <laughs> okay. Then, um, so that surgeon, this is a new idea to the surgeon. And so it's like, you know, no, I mean, that's not appropriate. This patient isn't appropriate. Then the nurse could say, well, well, all right, but, you know, here's the situation. You know, the pain is this, the dyspnea is this, and the thirst is this, and that. You know, I know you don't have all the time in the world to be addressing all of these issues. And I know the palliative care service does a great job with symptoms. Do you think we could call them in to help manage the patient's symptoms? Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love leading with, you know, you don't have all the time in the world. And truly, they want to they focus don't. on their surgery. Absolutely. And, that, and the things that go along with that. Yeah. And the, and the dealing with the, the dyspnea or the, the, the thirst or the whatever yeah. is kind of like, uh, yeah. you know. And, yeah. and you're showing respect. There's a um, an N-U-R-S-E um, process that we use that shows empathy 
and uh, addresses emotional needs. The N stands for naming. So I'm gonna use it on the surgeon. We talk about using it with family members. I'm gonna use it on the surgeon. Um, naming. I know that you are very busy, okay? You understand, N-U-R-S-E, you. Uh -huh. I understand that um, you are in surgery now and you know can't come down. R, and I really respect your expertise. S, support. Can we get some support, not just for you, but for the, for the patient, um, through perhaps calling the palliative care service? E is for explore. So can you tell me a little bit more about your thoughts now? Oh, so you're this. showing the respect, mm -hmm. you're understanding where they are, and like I said, usually we talk about using this with family members, um, but it, I use it at home with oh, my husband. Uh, so I, yeah, it's no, useful. My husband is a counselor, <laughs> and this sounds very familiar. Okay. <laughs> Not this exactly, but that process of yes. naming feelings, naming situations, supporting, yeah. and then asking a leading question yeah, and exactly. reframing things. Yes, yes, yes. <sighs> and you still might get a no. Yeah, you might. And so... Then you know. Then there's persistence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. How often have you in that? Do you really see a no that often though? Um, it it there are enough no's to know for you to expect you might get one. Okay. But then no K N O W, who with whom you work. I mean, you know, who are the people that are like the low hanging fruit on a tree they're easy to grab and mm -hmm. pull in mm -hmm. to where you are and mm -hmm. to work with like melissa being the low hanging fruit you know she's got she's this right knowledge. there she's yeah. right there there's the fruit way 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 at the top of the tree well you might try to re not try to reach for them right away bring mm. your colleagues in is there in particular attending in your icu mm. that has the sense of what we mean by palliation okay. and palliative okay. care so you know get your support okay that helps too um another question because we are running out of time but i want to do one more question so let's what talking point can you give the brand new nurse to the family when you want to bring in, do the consulting and the bring in palliative, mm -hmm. and you want to let the family know, mm -hmm. how do you let them know without them thinking hospice and dying? All right. How do you explain that to the family for the new nurse? Maybe like some talking points. Well, you might start out by just asking some questions. Oh, I love that. That's okay. sort of the counselor thing. You start out, you start <laughs> yeah. out asking questions. I love it. Yeah, to find out where they are and how they're doing and what's their understanding. That's another good question. What's your understanding of what's happening here? Okay, I what's your that's understanding the key for us as nurses in general? Really, is to to try and gauge where the, what the family, especially in critical care, to gauge where they're at and what their mm -hmm. understanding of mm -hmm. what the patients condition is exactly so you know it, it's we are more efficient at our jobs if we know a the family gets it perfectly or b i need to spend a little more time mm -hmm. explaining that the stroke is irreversible yes. or if i need to explain that while we might be able to to relieve the pressure from an intracranial hemorrhage i'm not going to be able to cure the cancer of the underlying cancer yes. or I, you know yeah. It, just, it, it can vary depending on where you work and what the, what the situation is, but if you know where the family is, that can really make your job a lot easier in caring sure. for the patient. Sure. And you can't assume you know where they are because you can, what do we do? We say, okay, so you're, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this. Do you understand? Yes. Right. And, then the, and then it's like, but wait a second. Just because someone says they understand doesn't mean they actually do. So starting with that leading question of tell me what you understand so exactly. that you can hear them verbalize it and then notify the or notice the gaps or the maybe the wrong thing because you know I, I, we're all human and we don't want to admit we don't know something sure. and and now you're a scared family member and you're in front of this you know person in scrubs that's really smart and you don't want to you know what I mean it's it's, oh, it's sure. very intimidating to be a family member in that perspective so I think it's important for us to empathize and start out with the leading question so yeah, yeah. We, I say all that to, okay, continue. <laughs> yeah, so actually, you know, here's another communication skill, and it's called ask, tell, ask. And really what we've, we're kind of doing that process here. You ask the question, 
What's your understanding of what's happening with your loved one? And then you go to tell. Well, these are some of the things that I'm worried about and um, the things that I've heard the physicians say to you and you know, give those worries to them. And then you ask, then you go to ask and say, does this make sense mm -hmm. to you? I love or that. how are you feeling now that we've had, you know, we've started this conversation? Mm -hmm. So there are actually real skills, you know, like remember when you put your first Foley catheter in? It was first you wash your hand, <laughs> and then you do this, and then you do that. It's a procedure. Communication oh, wow. is a procedure. And you can mm -hmm. learn, you can have a toolbox of communication skills that you can use. Um, and understand that you are there to support the family and um, you don't necessarily give the full diagnosis right but you then can say let me bring so-and-so in or would you like to sit down with us mm -hmm. and I say us this is a one of a very important thing I'd like to say when there are family meetings if at all possible you as a patient's nurse mm -hmm. should be there. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you can't, yeah. And don't I go feel out of my way yeah. to make sure that I can go and listen. Good. Mm -hmm. And don't feel like you have to be invited. I hear a lot of nurses say, "Well, they didn't invite me to the meeting." This is not a party. <laughs> <laughs> no, you this don't is need your an invitation. Right. This is your patient because when you're there, then you know what's being said. You sit next to the family member. I was going to say that very same thing. And sit you next do it. to the family, okay. not next uh -huh. to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, and be there. You're with the patient, or a nurse is with the patient 24 hours out of the day. Mm -hmm. Why take a family member, you know, why not be with that family member that you've developed a relationship right. with, right. and they've developed it with you. Mm -hmm. You're so. the one they trust, right? You're the you one know? they trust. When the doctor yes. leaves the room, they ask you for the clarification. Yeah. So it's so important. That's not a time to go take a break or go catch up with your other patient. Yeah. Like this is such a big priority to be in those. And you have to be in a culture in which you will support each other, that this is mm -hmm. valuable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As my colleagues and I feel, this is valuable, and we're going to support each other to mm -hmm. get to that meeting mm -hmm. or to consult about, you know, symptoms or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. work at a team. Um, oh, I feel like I cut you off though. Before the ask, tell, ask, you were gonna, the procedure of communication, um, to start with asking what's your understanding. What's your understanding. To that patient yeah. family that doesn't know what palliative care. So we wanna ask them what their understanding of the situation is. Yeah. And, then, and then how do we explain palliative? Well, you may or may not need to use that word at okay. the beginning. Okay. Um, and um, it, you, could say, you might say, um, you know, it seems to me we could use some help here. And, um, and I need to take, take a sidestep. Now, in our institution, the nurse cannot call on his or her own our palliative care service. It differs. Yeah, ours, okay. you have to have a physician consult. It was okay. like a doc-to-doc -doc thing at the hospitals I've been at. I think that's yeah. probably pretty common. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think one can usually say, I'm, I think we should call palliative care service. You should have had that conversation right. earlier. Right. But you can say, you know, um, so here are your interests, here are your needs. Um, we have some people I, I'm thinking about that might be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, you know, let's talk about that. And when you feel that the time is right, you can explain what the palliative care service does as, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to say, well, they come only at the end of life, but here's what this service can do. Mm -hmm. They can, they are really good at symptom management. Mm -hmm. So you go through yes. that process. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the time is appropriate, you can say palliative care services really help those like your loved one who are experience really severe illnesses. Mm -hmm. and and we don't know what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. So we want you to be best prepared. Mm -hmm. So this we don't know what's going to happen here mm -hmm. kind of suggests that if they think the person is going to survive, we don't think it. We don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. yet. 
I think I think it's a it's an adjustment. It's a it, it's a movement. It's not a one step or one statement. Yeah. But certainly, um, if there is you know some hesitancy, then you can say I understand, but I I just want you to know that we're here for you mm. and the service is here for you. Again, um, prov promoting that team. We're all here for we're you. We're all here for Patient you. Patient-centered. This yeah. isn't us versus them. This mm -hmm. is us trying to do something with you for your loved one. Yeah. But there are times when, you know, it's we have a palliative care service. Do you want to hear more about it? Mm. You're kind of getting them ready. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, you explain, you know, what, what you know, why mm -hmm. you th you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can say, you know, I hope, I really hope things go better than they're going now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I worry mm -hmm. that, they're, that they might not go better. Mm -hmm. What would your husband think about in this situation? Mm -hmm. What would he want? Mm -hmm. What doesn't he want? So you can be probing, and it's all about palliative care without you necessarily having to say, we're going to call in the death squad, or yeah, whatever yeah, their yeah. perceptions of it are. You have to bring them along. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is so important for us to understand, especially those of you that are new to critical care, because whether or not you like it, you're going to run into these situations probably arguably every shift, mm -hmm. I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, so the better understanding and knowledge base you have, the better you can communicate with your patients, advocate for your patients to the physicians um, to or whomever you need to advocate um, too, but the bottom line is you as the new critical care nurse or the nurse in whatever area really needs to have an understanding of palliative care. And I think we just got like the best, uh, you know, Definition. definitions. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to create, uh, you know, I was frantically taking notes <laughs> during this, guys. So I'm actually going to make some show notes. I'm going to put some links to some resources. And if you have any that you're like, this is the best one ever, please send those my way so I can add them. <laughs> let me let me say, start with AACN. Oh, yeah. They there are all kinds of, great of stuff ones. on oh, their website. Yes. So that's a great place to start. Yes. It so AACN.org, yeah. guys, is the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. Um, so I'm going to create like a list of resources and I'm going to create notes from this show that you can download um, with the, you know, ask, tell, ask the nurse and the, the definition between primary versus specialty palliative care and, and just the summaries of this, this little chat because it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much well, yes. thank for you. joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Um, and so yeah, check out um, freshrn.com slash podcast for the notes of this. And thank you guys so much for joining us and stay fresh. Damn crowd better hit the floor. All the other fellas better run for the door. Stop, drop, and roll with me. I got the heat that'll make.